it's Maggie Bot here to talk to you today about Gamecopolis. Uh, Gamecopolis is a Z-Man Games release from 2012, uh, designed by Xavier George, the guy that did uh, Carson City, and he also has a uh, Twa and Turne, the whole Twa line. Uh, so Gamecopolis is one to five players, plays in around an hour. It's kind of a light to medium weight euro. It has a little bit of card drafting and a lot of building, uh, bonus management if that's even a thing, and some really neat bits to it. Uh, this one, I'll go through the components and the kind of turn order and everything, and then I'll get to my views a little later after that. Um, so thank you, and let's dive right in. So the game has a a lot of these kind of city building tiles, um, some points of where to build. Each player is equipped with resources, a kind of hidden information screen, uh, mulligan tokens to kind of refresh their hand, uh, reminder posts for new builds, a lot of victory point chips, which kind of look like pretty little leaves. And then you have two different kinds of cards. You have character cards as well as building cards. Uh, character cards are used at the beginning of the game to sort of help you start a engine with some bonuses and give you your opening resources. These you'll actually draft. And in your first game, it's recommended that you just pull a set that has the same number in the corner. So there's lots of different kinds of these, as you can see. And this is part of what the theme is. So you're building a city out of Ginkgo Biloba. It's in the future, and these are the scientists and awesome futuristic people that will help you do that. Um, that is as far as I go for theme, kids. So if you were looking for highly thematic replays of all these games, this is not the place. Uh, and then you have um, a set of these cards. So you have numbered cards as well as some lettered ones. The numbered ones you don't need to shuffle. You actually put the three different colors in order from 4 through 20 because you're going to be plucking these out on purpose later in the game. Then what you have is your first player card that will pass around the table. And you also have letters cards, these ones that correspond to these letters on the outside. And the first three cards of each color, so one, two, and three, and these will actually go in a deck and get shuffled. So, as you can see, I did sleeve my set. I don't often sleeve games, but this one just gets shuffled so darn much I would sleeve these tiles if I could. But you'll see that the cards that are represented are the things that you can see out on the board. So the one through three tiles are here, and all the letter tiles are here. So that's what you'll have in the deck. All right, so the first step of any game of Ginkopolis are these character cards. Uh, now, character cards will have an ability on the bottom and resources on the top. The resources, I apologize, are called resources, which are in red here, victory points in yellow, and tiles in blue. These colors do not correspond to the color of resource or tile you'll get. They are the representation all the way through the game. So whenever you see the little red symbol here, that means your personal color of resources. So everyone has a supply, as you can see in front of the screen, and you'll earn them by taking them from your supply and putting them behind your player screen. So. In the beginning of the game, each player will be looking at four character cards, deciding which one they'd like to keep and passing the rest to the left. They'll re then receive three cards from their right and select until each player has three characters. There are three different types of bonuses on cards and the beginning characters have two of them. So these characters will have building bonuses whenever you build out, which is corresponding to letter builds, you will gain a something, which this one gives you a resource, or this one tells you whenever you build on top of another tile, you'll get something, which this one happens to be a resource. These characters are color-coded, so the bonuses on the blue cards have to do with tiles, and the bonuses on the yellow cards have to do with victory points. Victory point chips can be spent during the game, but in general this is how you'll win. You'll get some victory point chips during the game, and then there's some other scoring stuff that happens. I know that was super specific. 
So once every player has their three characters, they're going to take them and place them in front of their character screen. Now, we found it most helpful to just pile your characters like this, where you can see the bonuses, you don't need to be able to see the art for the rest of the game. You'll take whatever starting resources you selected, this guy has all of them. You would get uh, five resources, four victory points, and three tiles to start. All of those things are placed behind your character screen. They will take their tiles and put them behind the screen, and the game will begin. Uh, next, we will move on to what a turn looks like. All right, welcome to our city. This is a city in progress that I've started. As you can see, there are letters all around the outside of the city, and there are tiles on the center of the city. Each tile is represented by a card in the deck. So the two red is right there. So any tile you can see that doesn't have a great pillar on it is somewhere in the deck of cards we'll be drawing from. The rest of the cards are representing the letters that are on the outside. So this is the H here, this is the H there. Whenever you introduce something new into the city, you'll find the corresponding card and then add it in whenever the deck is shuffled. So I will say that again. Now the actual turn, we'll see each player with four cards in their hands. So you will see both the letters and the numbers come up because it's all shuffled together. And there's a few different ways to play each kind of card. Everyone selects their card at the same exact time, decides whether or not to use a tile with that card, which is one of the two ways of playing a card, and everyone will reveal them at the same time. The remaining three cards that they had will pass to the player to the left, and next round everyone will add another card to their hand. You will always be looking at four cards, three from the player before you, and one off the top of the draw deck. The draw deck is really important in this game because as you add tiles, and you shuffle the deck back in and you get the new stuff, you're going to get access to the new areas in the city. So, the two ways you can play a card are to play the card by itself, just to gather resources, or to play it and pay to build into the city. So you can build out wherever the letters are, or you can build up wherever the numbers are. Now, let's talk about just playing a card as a card. If this is the card I secretly choose, this one tells me that when I play it by itself for resources, I can either have one resource or one tile. And this is a random drawn tile off the top of a deck, so I won't know what it is. Or one of the resources from my supply will go behind my screen so I can pay for other things. So let's say we played F here. F will get put into the discard pile. I will collect my resource. And now, earlier we selected some characters with bonuses. Well, this character has a bonus that whenever I play a card, by itself, I also collect a victory point. So play a card without a tile, collect a victory point. If I had multiple bonuses, they stack, it's cumulative, so I would get multiple things from it. So this will net me one more victory point for this turn. I will place that into behind my screen. Now, let's look at our next hand of cards. So we have the three from the person next to us, and one off the draw deck. So now we have some more letters and a new number. If you play a numbered card without a tile, let's say we play this one here, I will collect whatever it represents, either resources, which are red cylinder cards, victory points, which are the yellow cards with the little fan symbol, or these blue cards, which are tiles. So this card would give me a tile equal to the height that this represents. So this is a one tile high building, so I would collect one tile from it. If instead I had had the card 16, I would collect two tiles because this is too high. And you can actually visually see how high they are by the number of resources on them, which we'll get into in a second. Now, I would play this, collect my tile off the stack, and this would still qualify for that character bonus, so I would also collect a victory point. Okay, so this is the fun part. This is the part where we actually build in the city. 
So we have a few options here. We have to build up on either one red or three blue, or we can build out at A or I. Let's build a letter. So we have two different options. We'd have to select it before we started building, but let's talk about what both of these would mean. So I is over here at the bottom where you can barely see it off the top side of the camera here. Scooch down. So we have A or I. Let's for a moment pretend I chose I. We're actually gonna choose A, we'll get to that in a second. If we choose I, we'll select a tile from behind our screen and add it to the board wherever I is. I can then be replaced on any side of that tile Usually it would build straight out, but if it's just kind of a weird one like this, we can put it over here. So next time someone builds I, it's going to actually go that way. And now what we do is we pay for this with a resource from behind our screen. And we'll mark for the banker that it's not in the deck with one of these gray pillars. This lets us know when we reshuffle the deck we need to add this card in. Because now it'll be an option for someone to build on later. Now what we get when we build from letters is we get whatever's adjacent to us when we build. This is adjacent to a resource square, so this will net us one resource. Now if this space had been three stacks high, if it had other tiles on top of it, we would collect one resource per tile in that stack. But at the moment that's a pretty inexpensive one. Now if, however, we had chosen A, we would move our lovely 20 here over to where the A is, place it into the map, replace the A either here or there, and now we will collect both a resource from the tile adjacent to it and a tile. So that one's a little bit better for us personally, so those will go behind our screen. And then yet again, we do a check of our bonuses. So I have two bonuses here for building out. So I collect a victory point and another tile. So that's a pretty profitable move. So we will take another tile off the stack, add it behind our screen, and another victory point. And the last option, and probably the coolest but most expensive, is how do we build on top of a number? So the first thing we do is identify where in the map that number is. We choose a tile from behind our screen, and we pay for it with resources equal to the new height of the, the build. So if I were to place this onto one, it's going to cost two resources, mark it with a pillar, and I don't get anything immediately for that. There's no, no benefit from building up, except this lovely card. You can't put the 1 back in the deck because it's buried by the 11. So now you get to actually put this in front of your screen. It becomes another bonus. That's how you get more bonuses. So now we do our little check. Each time we build a tile over a tile, we get a resource. So we'll collect that, put it behind our screen. And now that's all hunky-dory. So we continue drafting cards around the table. When the draw deck is empty and there's just a discard deck, we need to add in all the cards that are represented by these gray pillars. So these will be removed, the cards will be found, and they'll be shuffled into the deck. That way we get fresh blood, we get to see the new stuff. Now, a few more rules on building. So our builds before were pretty easy. This was a red tile going on top of a red tile, and it was in ascending order. It went from 1 to 11. If, instead, oh right, in a future turn, if we wanted to build onto the red 11, which is a new card, and we only had a yellow 8, there's a few things that need to happen. The 8 is still going to cost the same building amount, so the resources will go back to whomever they belong to, so this would go back to the white player. If it is an opponent that you're building on top of, each resource returned will also net them one victory point, so they will take victory points out of the central pool. If it's your own property, these will go back behind your screen, but you don't get any victory points. But now, when I place the 8 over the 11, I need to both change the color and pay to decrease the value. So it's an 11, I'm moving into 8, there's a difference of 3, so that's actually going to cost me 3 victory points. And that will be returned to the supply. 
uh, building three highs, so I need to put three resources on that. And in order to change the color, I actually need to pay an extra resource to change the zone of the building. So this goes back to my supply. What that means is we are affecting one of the in-game scoring opportunities in this game. So that's one thing we'll get into next. Uh, let's take a look at scoring and some of the component breakdown. The game of Gingopolis is triggered over when one of two conditions is met. When players have exhausted the tile pool for the first time in a game, each player will then check behind their screen for any extra tiles that they want to sell back to that pool. This is a one-time occurrence and everyone will decide at the same time how many tiles to sell back. But let's say the player wanted to sell three and this player played two, they would each get a victory point per tile they sold. Now when the next time happens that the, the pile is exhausted, so more people have taken their tiles, oh my god tiles everywhere, when that happens and there is zero more tiles, You'll finish that round and that'll trigger the end of the game. The other trigger for the end of the game is in the resource pools. Now the resource pool, the number of resources in it will vary by the number of players, but as soon as the players have earned all of their supply, ooh, all of them, and they've taken them and they place them out on the board, whenever they place their last piece of resources, that also triggers the end of the game. We found that it's often the tiles that will trigger the game over, except in the lower numbers of players. Now what happens at the end of the game? Scoring is done in a few different things. The most straightforward are the higher number cards, so the 20s and so, have some victory point conditions. And a lot of these are at the back of the book, so you'll probably have to look some of them up when you play. But anytime you see an equal sign on a card, it's suggesting that you get a number of victory points for something. The 20 just equals 9 victory points when you earn it. So when you place on top of a 20, which is kind of hard to do because you've got to pay extra for it, you're going to get nine victory points. Now this one is saying that for each bonus you have for laying tiles over tiles, you're going to get two victory points. This one's saying for each bonus you have that builds out, you're going to get two victory points. So players will add all of those together. They'll add up all the victory point chips they earned in the game. Now we have two of these little tokens. We have two of these little tokens. They're called mulligan tokens. Any time that you're looking at four cards and you'd like to reshuffle, you can spend one of your two mulligan tokens. These are really handy. You can add new cards into the deck with them if you get them timed right. But if you still have them at the end of the game, they're worth two points each. Now at the end of the game, the biggest scores that you can make in this game are for districts. This is a very limited sample because I'm just doing a little demo game with you. But by the end of the game, this city is really big and really tall. So what you do is you actually count groups of tiles. So if you have two or more tiles of the same color, you've built a district. So in this case, this red tile doesn't count because it's just by itself, as is this red tile. These blue tiles no one played onto. So I kind of deconstruct my city as I go so that I can keep track. Now these are yellow, so they make up one district. The person that scores the most is the person with the most presence. The white player in this case has five versus the two that the orange player has. The white player will gain one point for every resource in the district. The white player here earns seven points. Whomever has the second most, so that's the orange player, will gain one point for every resource they have. So they get two. Once those are taken care of, we just kind of move them out of the picture here. Whoa. Now we have this blue scoring district. Orange again has three to blacks one. So orange will gain four victory points and black will gain one. And in the last one, orange has two to white's one. So orange will gain three where white will gain one. Once you've added this to your mulligan token, then any victory points you have on cards, whomever has the most wins. There are tiebreakers. If you have the same number of resources in a district, whomever has the tallest building wins. And if they're the same height, whomever has the highest number building wins. That's all. So let's get to our wrap up. 
Kinkopolis for me lives in this kind of cool, very different place. Uh, it has a lot of drafting, it has a city building element, there is luck to the tile draw, but I feel that it's a little heavier than the number of rules it contains, which is kind of cool. There are a lot of moving parts, but they make sense. Uh, my first three or four games of this, uh, of Ginkopolis, got better and better and better, almost exponentially, how much I liked it. My first game was rough as hell. Trying to learn this one out of the rule book is a headache and a half? Three headaches? Uh, they just, they didn't quite get that point across of this is how the turn works. You do this and then this and then this, and then break down the different options. So just to reiterate for all of you, everyone selects a card, passes the three cards they don't select to the person to their left, reveals their card at the same time, may play it with a tile, then you draw another card off the top of the deck. And that's it. It's not a difficult game. There's just a lot of what does that mean? What happens when you blah? And how do the bonuses work? So having someone teach it is immeasurably helpful. Watching this lovely video, immeasurably helpful, I'm sure. Uh, so I don't know that it was the rule book's fault. It was maybe shorter than it needed to be, but it wasn't structured in such a way where it penetrated my skull. Um, I love the components. The quality of everything is fantastic. The art is neat, but unnecessary. Well, you know, I am always going to say the art is unnecessary, but it just didn't, the theme didn't fit it. I don't know if that was futuristic in any way, shape, or form. There were zero ray guns. Um, so I would give it a good solid seven and a half as a kind of light to medium weight euro and a surprise wonderful thing and you can probably pick it up because as far as i know it is still very available everywhere i go for about 45 bucks um i look forward to trying xavier george's other games he has twa which again i think i played one game of and just never picked it up again but what if it has the same effect what if it gets better the second time uh i wish I could make everyone I know play it twice. We have had one or two different structures of bonuses that work out really well if no one's willing to get in somebody else's way. So there, there are definitely mechanics that can be built upon for the expansion, but that expansion is a overdue. Uh, there is one, it's going to be a modular expansion, it's going to add either buildings or exports or things or blah, and you pick which ones of those you'd like to incorporate. I very much hope I can just throw it all in the box and shake it up and let it go, but I hate picking and choosing modular expansions. That is just the number of games I've got to play to get it right is not my favorite thing, so hopefully I can just put it all together. Okay, rant over, rant over. Uh, I hope you loved the video. I hope you try Ginkopolis. I, I know that it's available through either Board Game Arena or one of those online board game thingies, so maybe try it there first. And then do yourself a favor and play a game of it at home. For the very rare solo player, uh, the the solo play on the game is almost impossible to beat. They get a free tile every turn to build off of a random card. F that noise. His name is Hal. He will beat you in the face. So thanks everyone for watching. Please visit my site at maggiebot.com and we'll see you later.